if Georgia had 21 more Brock Bowers, I wouldn't worry <laughs> about them so much. Uh, Georgia goes into Auburn. Uh, what an atmosphere. You can always say that about Jordan yeah. Hare Stadium, but it wasn't even the best atmosphere that you see at Jordan Hare. It'll be better later this year, probably when Alabama's there. But Georgia has to fight. They have to dig deep. They only lead the game once they're late. Um, I mean, it gets late in the game before they even lead the contest. And then they have to put together a drive to win the contest down there against Hugh Freeze's first year Auburn program. What's your biggest takeaway first on just Georgia surviving Jordan Hare Stadium? Carson Beck, I think, grew up and became a different player throughout the course of that game. And Auburn's pretty good on defense. Now, I really, and I totally agree with Kirby Smart's comments after that. Like, there's not an appreciation for how hard it is to win on the road. As as you mentioned, especially at that place. Uh, I mean, of all the places I've broadcasted games, that place, particularly at night, would be in my top five most difficult places to win if you are a visiting football team. Um. And so I thought it was an inspired effort by Auburn. They got outlasted and out-talented, I guess, if you will, um, over the course of four quarters. And we can knock Georgia. We can criticize them. It's certainly fair because everybody's assumption was it was going to be so easy coming in. Look at the schedule. Look at the schedule. First off, it's not easy. It's never easy. And I actually think – the way this Georgia team is having to win is going to benefit them each and every week. They're going to be battle-tested. They're going to be hardened. They have not just gone on skates and just rolled through everybody. They've had to earn it. There's a lot to take from that 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 is positive. If you're a Georgia fan, if you're Kirby Smart, if you're this Georgia football team, the bottom line is, is Georgia really doesn't have many established playmakers at, at wide out outside of Brock Bowers, who, by the way, I think should be a Heisman Trophy candidate. Um, and, and I, and I say that sincerely, um, defensively, they seem to have, I don't want to take it a step back, but we're, we're not necessarily seeing the pure dominance, the ability to get home consistently. Um, and that's okay. I mean, they're obviously still probably a, one of the best defenses in, in America when you just look at their pure personnel. So I thought it was an impressive win because of where they were at, how hard it is to do it there. It wasn't pretty, but maybe this is going to be the Georgia team we see this year, Jim. This is going to be a team that's going to have to scrap and claw a little bit, and then they'll outlast people because they got depth and talent. It reminds me of some early Saban teams when they would just – you know, work and do what they had to do early. And by the end of the year, they were one of the best teams in the country. And I don't want to take anything away from what Auburn did. First off, uh, running the freaking football, they only passed six times in the first half. So you're going up against a Georgia team that had not allowed 200-yard rushing since pre-pandemic times. And Auburn goes out there and they get that in the first half. And with you have Peyton Thorne and Robbie Ashford at quarterback – Kirby Smart and those guys, they knew Auburn was going to have to run the football, and they still couldn't control Auburn running the ball. I thought it was an impressive, gutsy effort from that Auburn offensive line. Peyton Thorne running the ball, Robbie running the ball, and those running backs. Jarquez finally looked like his old self. Impressive day running the football for Auburn. Yeah, and they had a really good plan. I I think when they they realized, hey, listen, we have to force Georgia to play 11-on-11, meaning that if we don't run our quarterback, we're, we're, they're playing 11 on 10. So we have to have that be a focal part of, of the defense uh, to, to get them to commit, which you would hope would then open up the passing game. The problem is, is they're so deficient right now in the passing game from a consistency standpoint that the, the running of the quarterback and some of those explosive plays that were really impressive will only take you so far if you don't have anything, complement it and come off of that and consistently beat people downfield in the passing game. I think what happened is that game continued to wear on. Georgia realized that there isn't much else. So if we just hang on here and we keep the ball in front of us and we tackle, they can't just beat us doing this. There's going to have to be something else. And right now, Auburn – each and every week has struggled to find that something else. Last week it was against Texas A&M, and it was an abysmal performance through the air. This week you mentioned only six attempts. So they're, they're, they're a work in progress in the passing game. TR asked this question, Lukes. 
How do you not double Bowers down the stretch if you know what he's about, especially at that point in the contest? How much of that, and again, I'm the layman, I'm the fan watching, and you're the, you're the former quarterback and coach. How much of that is just Bowers running a route or Bowers finding space? And does double team help bracketing or any of that at that point? Well, it will, it will help. It will, it will lessen it. It will force Georgia and the quarterback to have to go somewhere else eventually. Now, the, the thing with Bowers, and if you look at the two back-to-back one-on-one plays, in, uh, one-handed play, uh, catches, and the one obviously was called back by, by a penalty, but sometimes when he's covered, he's not covered. And I, and I think that eh, you, you sit there and you tell your quarterback, hey, listen, if there's two defenders, we got to be really, really careful here. But if there's one defender, um, he's winning. So go ahead and give him a shot. Give him a chance. Put the ball where he has an opportunity. But anytime somebody chooses to play in and out or bracket style coverage or, or you know, clamp down and try and take advantage of putting him in a box, that means you're taking a defender away from some other area of responsibility, which should open up uh, some opportunities for guys to get open. So now what has to happen? Your quarterback's got to be disciplined enough to work through that progression, identify that this isn't a go-to guy right now because of how they haven't bracketed. We're going to have to go find out where are they now void uh, because they've chosen to, to take him away from us. And then secondly, Georgia needs guys to step up and make plays when that happens. They need guys to get open. They need guys to find the open void uh, because an extra player is being used to to take away Brock Bowers. But I, I, I go back to my initial statement. Even when he's covered, he's not covered. Yes, and and I think if, if the quarterback feels that good and, the, and Mike Bobo and the staff have enough confidence in Carson Beck to not put the offense at risk by just forcing the issue, then even if you do decide to double him or you decide to press him at the line of scrimmage, get in his face, you still have a shot. You still have a shot to make a play with him. He's that good. Yeah, and, and let's don't. I mean, one-handed catches when there's some Auburn guys there you know, oh, yeah. protecting the other hand. Carson Beck had to make good throws there, good enough throws, and not throw interceptions and give him a chance to make the catch. And back to back for a second, a 98-yard touchdown drive just to tie it 17-17 in the second half. And then that drive with 252 finally hits Bowers. Game's on the line there. If he makes a mistake, it's overtime or a yep. loss for Georgia. Um, those, those are some ballsy throws in the second half from Beck. Yeah, they were, and they were confidently made, though. Like, if you watch him, there was no hesitation. It was decisive. I see it. I'm hitting it. I'm planting the back foot, and I'm driving the ball into it. And I, I thought, like I said, I thought he grew up. I thought he, the, the moment was not too big for him. Um, and that place is raucous, as we've talked about it, especially late if you're trying to mount a drive. I just thought he kind of turned a page a little bit uh, from what we've seen in the first four weeks. And listen, if you start to get hot at the quarterback position, you start to really mature and develop and and, uh, and gain some confidence. The people around you all of a sudden going to get better as well. So uh, we might just be seeing, you know, the the early stages of what the offense potentially could be. And Lad McConkey, who made his debut, uh, he was on a pitch count. But it seemed like the balls he caught were always third down crucial catches. The kid just found a way to get open. He, he was huge, a small factor, but huge for Georgia to, to escape with a win. Mr. Reliable, man. And yep. he's, he's kind of like your safety blanket, right? And if you need third and seven, he's going to get to nine. You know, if you, if you need third and 11, he's going to get to 13. He's going to make sure that he knows where he's supposed to be, when he's supposed to be there. Really good versus zone because he knows how to settle into the open voids. Uh, but he. Getting him back, we just discussed, you know, guys having to make plays around Brock Bowers, but, like, he's a go-to guy because he's going to be so unbelievably reliable and he's going to be where he's supposed to be. Uh, NH says one key stat for Auburn, six out of nine of the incompletions by Thorne were drop balls by the receivers. Some of those coming on third down that could have kept some drives going for Auburn. Bobby, Little T, and others in the chat room saying the takeaway for them is Auburn people is Hugh Freeze calling the plays, more involved in the game plan, whatever factor was, uh, made that team a little bit more competitive offensively. But much like Deion Sanders has said a couple of weeks now, 
you better get me now because this is the worst roster I'm going to have. This is the worst roster Hugh Freeze is ever going to have at Auburn. And, and a lot of Auburn yeah. fans left Jordan-Hare Stadium on Saturday saying, I liked our effort. I like where we're going with Hugh Freeze. Well, if your fans and your supporters recognize effort and they recognize improvement, we said this on your program right here that each of the last two weeks that this is what you're hoping to see if you are Auburn. You kind of know what this is going to be. It's not going to be easy. At times it's going to be ugly. But are you showing incremental improvement? Is there buy-in and is there effort? If you leave the stadium and you feel good about those things, then yes, you're going to feel really, really good about the overall result in years to come. Because uh, whether it's the transfer portal, whether it's through high school recruiting, um, the roster can get a lot better a lot quicker. Um, I used to always say you can't just wave a magic wand and poof, all of a sudden everything changes overnight. Now you kind of can. So um, I, to me, when you're going through a season where you're not going to be overly talented or maybe you're going to struggle to get wins each and every week you take the field, if there's effort that is evident and showing up, you're in a good place because effort requires no talent, none. So your guys are either going to do it or they're not, and that's a reflection of coaching. It's a reflection of leadership. So – from an Auburn fan, I, I, I totally if, – if I'm an Auburn fan, and from their perspective, I get it. Like, I, I love that they recognize, hey, listen, that – you know, we were supposed to get our doors blown off and we competed and battled. 